All right, hopefully this is still working. Um, this is the Fedora Classroom on Silver Blue. Uh, my name is Micah Abbott. I'm a principal quality engineer at Red Hat. I work on the Red Hat Core OS project currently. Um, I'm going to give you a overview of the Silver Blue project and some of the technologies behind it. Uh, some ground rules, please keep your audio and video off during the presentation um, and hold all your questions towards the end. Uh, I'll be in uh, Pound Fedora Classroom uh, in, on Freenode after the presentation and I'll answer any questions in there to the best of my ability. So, uh, what is Fedora Silver Blue? First of all, Fedora Silverblue is Fedora. It is a project supported by the Council. It has the same principles as all the other Fedora projects. It uses the same RPMs built uh, in the Fedora infrastructure. Uh, we just deliver them in a different, with a different mechanism using OS3, which I'll talk about in a few slides. Fedora Silverblue also uses containers. Uh, in container technology, uh, we have a set of tools that is uh, heavily used in the Fedora space uh, around containers that uh, we ship by default as part of Silverblue. We also ship by default the ability to run flat packs, which are basically containers for your GUI applications. Uh, and I will talk about these uh, in later slides. Uh, Silverblue is also can also be defined as an immutable host. I have a definition for that coming up. And lastly, Fedora Silu, I think, is very awesome. It's a excellent way to uh, containerize your workflow and provide atomic upgrade capabilities. Uh, and I'm going to get into all that kind of stuff as we get along. So, but first, I want to talk about immutable host. You may have heard this term before, or also uh, an immutable infrastructure. The way I define an immutable host is uh, one where the OS is delivered in such a way that it's difficult or impossible to modify. Uh, this allows for uh, the idea of ca uh, pet ver versus cattle hosts. Pets, pet hosts are ones where they are uniquely crafted and uh, you don't want to lose their configuration or lose the ability to run them, whereas cattle are more disposable. Uh, you are able to uh, lose those servers or those hosts without too much fear of, of hurting your infrastructure. Uh, these immutable hosts also provide foundation for repeatable deployments. Uh, these are sometimes referred to, referred to as Phoenix servers, ones where you are able to take down the host and then reprovision it um, uh, nearly instantaneously or very quickly at least with the exact same configuration that the host had previously. Uh, typically, these uh, immutable hosts are delivered as an image or an image-like artifact, like artifact. And previous examples, we had uh, the Fedora Red Hat, Hat OS, we had, Atomic Host, which was RPM-based, just like Silverblue. Uh, we had Container Linux, which was made by the CoreOS company before Red Hat acquired it. And that was a Gen 2-based system. Uh, we also had Endless OS, which is a OS made by the Endless Computing uh, Company. They use Debian for their, uh, their basis. So let's compare Silverblue to a traditional Fedora workstation. They both have some similarities uh, in that they both use the same RPMs from the Fedora ecosystem. Uh, they both support package installation package installation, so you can do the equivalent of a DNF install uh, on Silverblue, although the mechanism is slightly different. Uh, and they both have the ability to run containers and flat packs, uh, where, whereas in Fedora Workstation, you'd have to install those tools uh, after the fact. In Silverblue, we ship them uh, out of the box. Some of the differences between the two come into, uh, come into the file system, for example. Uh, on Silverblue, you can only write data to uh, var in etc. This uh, lets you store your, da your data under subdirectories in var 
Um, actually, your home directory is also mounted under var. Uh, and you can configure your system typically, as you typically would on any other Fedora system under etc by moderate, modifying the config files there. Where this comes in, where this is powerful, uh, is it prevents uh, malicious RPMs or mistakes in RPMs from uh, destroying your your host. Uh, this is a screenshot from, uh, I believe it was a, a RPM that installed some of the NVIDIA drivers, and there is a one one typo that caused the RPM to delete all of slash user. This is not possible in uh, Silverfield because slash user is not writable by RPMs or the user. Silverblue and Workstation also have different upgrade mechanisms. Um, Silverblue uses an atomic transactional update. Uh, during this time, your running system is not touched. You uh, the updates are actually loaded in the back, loaded in the back, in the background, in the background. Uh, we use bubble uh, we wrap, bubble wrap, wrap for part of this to protect the protect system, from, system from the percent of percent post scripts, post scripts post that run in. Uh, because of this, you can pull the power on a solar blue host during an upgrade, during and an upgrade, your host will and your host reboot, will reboot back into reboot, the reboot previous back into deployment. The previous deployment. The trade-off is that you have to reboot your host to get into your upgrade deployment. The trade-off is the upgrade you reboot your host does not to get into your, your upgrade or running because the upgrade does not touch your running. This prevents these kind of problems, which is a, a screen grab from these a kind of problem, which is in the Blog screen grab from from Fedora QE engineer. Adam Williamson's blog where he talked about Fedora QE uh, running in F upgrade, where he talked uh, from about desktop running actually DNF crash your X system in uh, from about desktop is actually crash your X system in. And I hear some echo, so I'm going to bounce over to Blue Jeans and, and I hear some echo, so I'm going to bounce over to Blue Jeans and the chat. Let's I'm just muting some folks that show their microphone on. Okay. All right, back to the, the classroom. Uh, so yes, Thor Blue and Workstation also have uh, different delivery mechanisms. Silverblue delivers our, the OS as an OS tree commit. Um, the OS tree commit is actually built up from RPM, so we do use RPMs in a way. Um, but we bo both uh, Silverblue and Workstation can install RPMs um, after the fact. Uh, after the fact, so like I said before, in Workstation you could do a DNF install. In Silverblue, it would be something like it would be uh, RPM OS tree install, and I'll show you some examples of using RPM OS tree uh, in the next couple of slides. So let's talk about OS3 and RPM OS3, which are the which is the technology stack that is. I'm sorry, let me bounce over to Blue Jeans again to make sure. Okay, sorry you can't hear me. I just don't want to uh, get any echo on this uh, this recording. Uh, so OS tree is, uh, like I said, is the core of the uh, technology stack behind Silverblue. Um, it provides, it's a library, it's also a command line utility. Uh, we can generalize it, at, simplify it as a git for an operating system. Uh, the individual files on your of your operating system or your file system are checksummed and then tracked in a, a content addressed object store. Uh, the files on the host are actually deduplicated versus via hard links. And OS3 is also able to handle uh, your bootloader configuration and your management of slash etc. Uh, and this little example I have here, it shows you how you can use OS3 to track individual files. Uh, I've initialized a uh, OS3 repo. I've made some directories and files and then committed those files, that file system, 
to a commit on the in the OS re repo on the uh, master branch of the repo, and then afterwards I've created a second a second directory and used OS3 to check out the master branch, which uh, lays out the files that I had originally committed. And this is the same thing that we do uh, for RPMs when we build the OS3 commit for the entire operating system. Uh, do we just do it at any very la uh, larger scale, obviously? So RPM OS3 is defined as a hybrid image slash package system. Well, it uses libos3 as the base image format uh, we can like i said before we compose the os3 uh, from the rpms on the server side uh, and then on the client side we use rpms as well uh, using libdnf to handle package installs uh, rpm os3 is also the primary endpoint entry point for managing your os and we'll get into that right now so when you manage your Subaru OS, you're going to be using the RPM OS3 uh, CLI uh, primarily. Uh, there is planned support for uh, RPM OS3 support uh, for, for GNOME software to do some of this, and there is the initial uh, implementation there. It's just not as robust as we would like yet. Um, so, all right, I'm going to switch over. So this is a RPM OS3 status output can't really read it because it's cut off, so I'm going to pop over to my own terminal. This is on my own host right now, and I'm going to give you the same output that I was trying to copy there. And I want to point out a couple of things in the output. So at the very first line, we have the state of RPM OS3. Uh, there are no operations happening right now, so it's idle. We have the ability to configure uh, automatic updates. Uh, this the the timer for those just as you can see here ran 15 hours ago, and then we have a list of deployments. Uh, the first and the deployments are what we call, are are basically the the versions of the OS that are either you either booted into, you have uh, the ability to roll back into, or uh, at a deployment that will be booted into on the next reboot. So. In this example, the deployment with the dot, which I've highlighted here, that is the deployment that I'm currently booted into. It has a OS3 uh, URL, which points at the Fedora workstation remote, and the Fedora, this Fedora 29 x 64 silver blue branch. Uh, we've got the version information, the commit hash, GPG signature validation, and then any layered packages that are on my system. The deployment that's first in the list, that is the pending deployment. That is the upgrade upgraded deployment. As you can see, the version number is date-based, so this is uh, newer than the one I'm in right now. And as I said, it, when you do an upgrade, it doesn't touch your running system, so this is basically just staged in the background wait, waiting for me to reboot into it. And then the, uh, the deployment in third in the list is the previous deployment that I was booted into uh, before I was running the current one. Uh, this gives us the ability to reboot into the new one. We can stay booted into this one right now, but as soon as we reboot, it is going to change because the, the deployment that's first in the list will always be the one that you get booted into unless you instruct it otherwise. We also have the ability to roll back to a previous uh, deployment if we find that the current deployment does not suit us. So I scroll further down, I have a fourth deployment that I pinned, and this is a uh, deployment from Fedora 28 that I was running that I had pinned to my host before I had done the rebase to Fedora 29. I could probably actually garbage collect this at this point. Uh, and then finally, the, the piece of output I wanted to show you is the available update. Now, this matches the same deployment that was first in the list that I originally showed, uh, but I wanted to point out that we actually can show you which CVEs, which security advisories have been fixed in the next, uh, in the next pending deployment or the next upgrade deployment. 
which I think is a important piece of information to have when you are considering uh, when to reboot into your upgrade deployment. So that's status. So when we want to do an upgrade, we use RPM OS tree upgrade. And what that looks like is uh, we have to, have to do that privileged. It pulls the objects from the OS tree repo uh, and it will print out the packages that have been upgraded, any packages that have been removed in the new deployment and any packages that have been added in the new, new deployment. Uh, it will also print any packages that have been downgraded if as you change deployments, Typically, we don't see downgraded packages as part of the upgrade process, but it, it's not out of the question. Uh, RPM OS3 does not really care about version numbers in terms of what's newer, what's older. It just sees it as uh, a, a, a set of files that it's writing to the disk. Um, at the end of the upgrade, it prints out a message saying that we have to reboot before we can enter into this upgrade deployment. So when we reboot, uh, as I showed you, uh, this looks similar, a little little trimmed down than the one I showed you on my own host. You can see that the first deployment in the list is now uh, booted into, as signified by the little dot here. And the uh, deployment we were previously in uh, is available to roll back into. So I keep saying our, uh, roll back. So that's a function of RPOS3. So if we did have uh, a situation where the upgrade deployment wasn't working the way we wanted to, uh, if there was a, a problem with a particular package or whatnot, and you wanted to go back to your previous one, we can use the RPM OS3 rollback command. Uh, so in this in this situation, we have the new deployment um, 2901.12.0. And we use the rollback, rollback command, and all that does, because both deployments live on the disk, all it's really doing is swapping the bootloader uh, to boot into the previous deployment. And as part of the rollback command, it prints out the package changes uh, just like you would see during an upgrade. So because we're going backwards in time, uh, we see that packages have been downgraded. There are packages that have been removed and their packages have been added. And again, it prints out you must uh, the note about rebooting into the, the new deployment. And if we do a status again after the rollback, we see that the older deployment is now first in the list. We're still currently booted into the uh, upgrade deployment, but now the older deployment is um, staged as the next deployment we will reboot into. Uh, so when we, we when Fedora releases a, a, a new major version, we need to use the RPM OS3 rebase command. This allows us to go from say 28 to 29 or 29 to 30. It also allows us to go backwards in time if we wanted to. So if you were running Fedora 29 right now uh, and wanted to use Fedora 28, you could use rebase to, to do that. Uh, the way we do this uh, in the major upgrade uh, scenario going from say 29 to 30 or 28 to 28 to 29 we would add a OS tree remote that points to that uses the uh, newer actually in this case I'm doing a uh, I'm going backwards to 28 so I'm on 29 I'm going to 28 so I've added a newer remote here the first line that points at the Fedora 28 GPGT I've named the remote silver blue 28 and I've provided the URL to the OS tree repo. Then I use RPM OS tree rebase, give it the remote name and the branch name, and it does a similar operation that we've seen before where it's pulling in the new objects. Uh, you can see that some of the patches have been upgraded, which is odd as we're going backwards to an older version, but you'll see that the packages are going from FC29 to FC28. And then when we inspect the status, we see we have a new deployment that matches the Silver Blue 28 remote and the new Fedora 28 branch. Uh, so when we reboot our host, we would be in the new Fedora 28 
or I should say the old Fedora 28 deployment. It's also possible to switch the entire OS. Because RPM OS3 and OS3 just treat the files as files, there's no real concept of uh, switching between OSs, I guess you'd say. It, it's hard to describe, so I'm just going to, to demonstrate it. So in this example, I've actually added a re OS tree remote that points to uh, the CentOS Atomic Host uh, OS tree repo. You know, we point at the mirrors on the CentOS org. And then I use the rebase command again, and I give it the CentOS remote, point at the CentOS branch, and it does the same thing. It pulls the files down from the remote, stages the deployment, and you can see that the next time we reboot, it will actually be able to boot into a CentOS host. Now, the utility of this is not really great. I mean, it, you probably don't want to be switching between a, an atomic host base system and a server boot base system, but it's a very, I think, a very interesting party trick. Um, you can impress your friends with it. So moving on. So package layering. So we talked about, I talked about earlier how we can, how Fedora Workstation has the concept of DNF install for installing packages, and in Superboot we have a slightly different command. Uh, we call it package layering. So package layering is the way to install additional packages um, to the host that wasn't, were not included as part of the base layer. Um, in my opinion, I think the, param the, the paradigm we should be following is to try to containerize as many applications as possible, containerize as many RPMs as possible, um, and use package lay layering as a last resort. However, that's not always feasible. Um, package layering is useful for what we call host extensions like libvirt and uh, PCSC Lite, which is used for card readers. Um, when you do perform a package layering operation, we actually create a new OS3 commit that includes the packages that have been layered on top of the base OS. Uh, you have the ability to override your base package set with uh, commands like o RPM OS tree override, remove, and replace. And these package layers are all tracked with the base OS. So if you have layered in a new package on your base OS, say if I did RPM OS tree, I'll show you an example actually. It's, I do like a RPM OS tree install S trace, and the next time uh, the host OS is, uh, there's a upgrade available and S-Trace is part of, um, is also upgraded, you will get the upgraded version of S-Trace when you uh, upgrade your host. So let's see an example. So the most common operation is RPM OS3 install or uninstall. In this example, I've done an install of the utility JQ. Um, and RPM OS3 install uh, supports uh, RPMs that are local to the disk, so you can build your own RPM and then install it uh, onto your, your Silverboot host or, or pull it from a repo. It understands DNF repos as well, so you can, you, you still have Etsy, uh, yum.repos.d, and all the Fedora repos are still there on Silverboot. Uh, so RPM OS3 will query those, those repos and look for the packages to install when you request them. So in this case, I've just done JQ. And that's in the repos, so it goes to the the Fedora repos, and it pulls down the necessary metadata in the packages. And right at the bottom here, it says it's added these two packages. JQ is the one I requested, and Oniguruma is a dependency of JQ. If we do an RPM OS3 status, you can see we have a a new commit, a new deployment created with a new commit. Uh, hash, and we have a new uh, piece of info showing the layer packages that were requested. It was JQ. Uh, it doesn't list the dependencies of that package, but those are tracked. So if you were to RPM OS tree uninstall that package, all the dependencies would be removed as well. Um, and just as before, to get into our new deployment, we need to reboot it. So if I do a JQ right now, uh, the command's not there, but after I would reboot into the host, uh, the command would be available. So I talked about uh, replacing packages in the base set. In this case, 
I'm going to replace Podman, which is the uh, tool for managing container, running and managing containers uh, in in Silverblue, or the preferred tool, I should say. So we have a certain version of Podman, and I've said, given the command RPM Ostry override replace and given it a URL. And RPM Ostry has downloaded the the RPM, and you can see we've downgraded Podman from 0.12.1 to 0.10.1, and that's reflected here in the status with the replace base package name. Uh, because we're override, we're doing an override replace. Uh, if there's a new version of Podman that won't be updated um, uh, by default, uh, it will come as part of the base OS. However, we will maintain the, the replaced base package, this override, uh, during those upgrades, unless you decide to remove that base that that override. And as I said, as I said, we can also remove packages from the base OS. So in this case, I chose VirtualBox Guest Editions, which is an RPM we ship by default in SolarBlue. And I'm point. I just wanted to show that the following uh, binaries are shipped as part of uh, that RPM. And then I decided I wanted to show how it, we would remove it, or RPM OS3 override remove. After I reboot my host, I can see my new deployment is booted into with a dot, got a new commit hash, and the base packages have been removed, the virtual box guest editions have been removed, and you can see if I try to list out the one of those binaries that existed previously, that's that's no longer there. So containers. Um, so containers are Linux. They're just little process. They're just a, a Linux process. On the host. Uh, they're just put into their own uh, C groups and namespaces and um, as, we, as I, I say here, those are, the containers are enabled through C groups and user namespaces and network namespaces, uh, as well as PID namespaces. And um, there's, there's a list of, I think, eight different namespaces that are used. Uh, you probably have heard of Docker. Um, they were the company and the tool that popular uh, that made running containers easy um, and kind of grew the adoption of microservices in, in the industry. Uh, and as I said, they're usually a single process per container, but it's possible to run more than one process uh, within a container. So in Fedora, we try to push the, the set, this new set of tooling that has come out of our container runtimes group. Um, we have four new tools called Builda, Podman, Gopio, and Fedora Toolbox. Builda is the tool for building our container images. Podman is the tool to run and manage our containers. Gopio is a tool that we can use to inspect a remote, reg a remote container registries uh, and also copy container images between different uh, registries and container storage types. And finally, we have Fedora Toolbox, which is a new utility um, developed for Silverblue that allows us to create pet containers where we can install development tools and libraries. Uh, let's see some examples here. So Builda, as I said before, it's the tool we use to build our container images. It supports building uh, images from Docker files. So if you have a set of Docker files already, you can migrate to Builda pretty easily by just passing those Docker files into to Builda as arguments. Uh, you can mount a working container to do uh, container image creation that way. Uh, and we, it supports the OCI image for, format by default, but also the Docker image format as well. So in this example, I'm doing the uh, working container uh, example, where I've done uh, a, a build-up from scratch. So I've got a scratch container made, and then I mount the scratch container. So now at the... Uh, container file system is mounted into my ho onto my host, and I can uh, do things into that file system. So, for example, I can do a DNF install, and here I've done a DNF install in JQ. And the the trick I've done here is to specify the install root of the 
uh, working container that I've mounted. Then I commit the container. I named it JQ. I've unmount the working container and then remove it. And when I use a, use build it images to list out the containers on my host, I've got the JQ container that I just created using build up uh, available uh, to use. So now let's use it. So we use we're going to use Podman. So Podman is, like I said, the tool to run and manage containers in Fedora. Uh, it's intended as a drop-in replacement for most of the Docker CLI. Just like Builda, it supports the same image formats, OCI and Docker. Uh, it doesn't require uh, a daemon, like a daemon running on the host, like Docker does. It allows you to manage the full container lifecycle, and you can also uh, run containers as an unprivileged user, so you don't need root access. This is still somewhat inexperimental, but uh, it it marks a new uh, new way of running containers in the uh, for Silverblue and Fedora at, at large. So here we've got uh, I've got build the images shown where I built the I got the JQ container. Uh, Podman shares the same container storage as Builda, so Podman is also able to uh, list out the same image and Running the container as simple as uh, podman run. Uh, I'm doing it privileged in this case uh, as a privileged user with sudo. Uh, and I'm piping out, I'm piping the output of RPMO status as a JSON in JSON format to JQ and just selecting the checksums of the deployments available. And you can see that uh, it returns the checksums exactly as, as, as I expected. Simple as that. Scopio is uh, is more of a is not a tool you would use uh, in your day to day necessarily. Uh, it's helpful for inspecting remote registries. So if you're doing a lot of work with remote registries, you can use it to inspect the tags on an image on a remote registry. Um, it does allow you to copy images between registries between storage mechanisms. Um, but most commonly, I use it for just inspecting registries. So uh, in this example, uh, I've done a Scopio inspect. I've given a Docker uh, URL uh, pointing at the Fedora registry and just inspecting the contents of the Fedora image. And it spits out a lot of inform uh, information about the container, it's the container image, including all the tags associated with that image. And things like the architecture of it and when it was created, some of the labels and whatnot. Handy for debugging problems, the remote registries, but you might you may not use it as often as the other tools. Finally, there's Fedora Toolbox. Uh, this is a tool that creates a uh, what, I, what we call pet containers. This is where you would install your uh, development utilities uh, and development libraries. It does operate as a rootless container, so you don't need any uh, privileges to run it. Uh, you can layer it. It's it's available as an RPM, so you can use package layering to install it as uh, a, a package on your host. It has not yet been included in the default uh, OS of Silverblue yet, but I'm sure it will be. Or you can run it directly as a script. It's just a bash script, so you can go to the upstream GitHub source, uh, GitHub repo, and uh, run it from get it from there. Uh, and it, the, the neat, one of the, the neat tricks that makes it so great to use is it automatically mounts in your home directory uh, into the container so you have access to some of the same data that you would have on your host. So this is how you would use it. Um, in the first couple lines, you can see me on my, uh, my host machine. You start with Fedora Toolbox Create, and it will pull a container, pull down the container image and create the container, and then you enter into the container, and you can do all your work in the container now. So in this short example, uh, I've done an install of strace. Uh, and it looks, it's since it's a Fedora container, it just uses DNF as, uh, as you would on any other Fedora system. And after it's installed, strace is available, and you can see we have version 4.26. And just to show you how the container persists, I've exited out of the container here. 
and then re-entered container again and the output is cut off a little bit here i apologize but you can see that s trace is still there because the container state has been maintained uh, and you could continue to install additional packages and just keep exiting and entering whatever you like very handy for your pet development containers and your development workflows so flat packs flat packs are basically containers for gui apps if you've ever tried to run uh, some sort of GUI app in a uh, container by itself, it can be real tricky. There are people that have done it. However, I recommend using flat packs. Uh, but uses libos tree to store the runtimes required for running the, the GUI applications, um, as well as the application itself onto the disk. Uh, it uses bubble wrap to allow um, untold users to uh, set up and run these containers as well as uh, Dbus and systemd and some app stream metadata. The apps can be distributed in OCI image format or via OS tree repos. And it allows for distribution of apps on any flavor of Linux. So the Flatpak utility is actually available for a number of distributions. So once you package up an application um, as a Flatpak and distribute it through a uh, Flatpak repo, any user who has Flatback installed on their on their host, whether it's Fedora or Arch or Ubuntu um, or Debian. Oh, well, I don't want to say Debian because it might not be packaged there. But the idea is package your applications once as Flatpaks and then run them wherever you can run Flatpaks. So what does it look like to use Flatpaks? I've done a lot of a lot of, I do want a lot of on the command line initially, just for the purposes of this demonstration. Uh, I've added the flat hub uh, flat repo, which is the probably the most popular repo uh, available right now. It contains uh, free and non-free applications in the repo. So it's up to you to choose which ones you want to use. Uh, and then once the remote has been added, I can search for an application. So in this case, I search for Spotify, and we see we have a, uh, a hit there for Spotify. And then we do a flat pack install of the, of the Spotify client. And it prompts you, you know, do you want to install it? Uh, here are the uh, runtimes that are required for it. Here are the permissions and accesses that it's, it's asking for. And you can confirm or, or deny those uh, those requests. And then, similar to what we see during a RPM OS3 operation, it pulls down the files from the repo, writes them to disk, and then when we list it out after it's all done, we can see we have uh, these two runtimes that were required for Spotify, Spotify, and we have the application itself. But once that's completed, you can actually access Spotify. Um, through uh, the GNOME desktop as you would normally. Um, I'm going to try to do that right now because I have it in my host. So if I type in Spotify, you can see we have a Spotify client that looks a lot like any other Spotify client you would install via RPM. But this is actually running as a flatback, which is pretty great. Uh, FlatHub, like I said, there are hundreds of applications that are packaged on FlatHub. Uh, I would suggest that if you're going to use Flatpaks, you go over there and, and check them out. So that covers all the technology, well, not all the technology, but most of the technology of uh, Fedora Silverblue. Um, and this is my spiel about where we want to go with Silverblue in the, in the future. Uh, there's still a lot of rough edges to smooth out. You, If you are going to use Silverblue, you are probably going to want to be ready to handle the occasional uh, bug or problem uh, and be uh, responsive in the community to report those kind of problems so we can get them sorted out. Uh, ultimately, we want to enable uh, the automatic uh, upgrades of the OS. Uh, as I showed you in one of the early... Uh, examples or early slides. RPM OS3 has the ability to do automatic upgrades in the background. So when you enable that, it will 
periodically check for upgrades and then download those files in the background into a new deployment. Again, not touching your running system. And then you are able to choose when you want to reboot your host to get into that upgrade. Right now, uh, these automatic upgrades are optional, but we think it's very valuable to have the ability to, to download those updates in the background for all the users. Um, right now, we don't install any flat packs out of the box because the main source of flat packs has been FlatHub and they ship uh, a combination of free and non free software. We didn't feel it was prudent to enable that repo um, by default. However, there's work has been done recently to uh, stand up a flat pack repo for in the Fedora infrastructure. So there are plans to uh, create more flat packs based on Fedora RPMs and distribute them that way. Hopefully, in the next major release, we'll see more and more of that. Uh, and then, very long term, we also want to make Syllabus the default workstation choice. So, if you I don't know when this will happen, uh, but we have visions of when a user decides to install for our workstation, they will get the Silver Blue experience, Silver Blue experience by default. I think we're a bit of a ways away from before that happens, but it's a goal to shoot for. Uh, and then finally, we want to improve our docu existing documentation and grow the community at large. So if you have any questions, uh, I'm going to go hop into Fedora Classroom on Freenode. Uh, you can also come hang out in uh, Pound Silver Blue on Freenode. Uh, there's a number of users there who hang out and are willing to ask questions. Uh, you can join the forums uh, on the discourse, the Fedora Discourse site. Um, file issues that you find with Silver Blue uh, on Fedora, uh, and also engage with uh, us on Twitter at Team Sewer Blue. And you can reach me on Twitter as well uh, at Raygear. Uh, and I'll be happy to point you in the right direction if I don't know the answer to whatever question you have. And with that, I am done. I'm going to stop the recording.